Hello and well, welcome to today's talk. It is Thursday the 15th of April. Now we were looking yesterday at the possibility of thromboembolic and thrombocytopenic side effects from the Janssen, Johnson and Johnson vaccine. The thrombocytopenia is the low platelets, the, uh, the thrombosis is the blood clots. And uh, there's also possible connections with this with the um, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine as well. Now what is going on here is interesting and what I'm about to tell you reflects my current thinking. Now this is the paper that this first part is based on. This is from, I think this is from 2000, yeah, December 2006. And this paper is uh, adenovirus induced thrombocytopenia. And then th this is about various uh, factors that influence blood coagulation in the blood. So um, this is really quite interesting. It turns out that this potential side effect was already known about. So let me tell you what I know about it now. Uh, do we need to change vaccination protocols? I think the answer to that is very probably we do. And I'm going to tell you what I've done about that in a minute. This is from papers from the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine, Queen's University, Canada. So reputable stuff, peer reviewed, of course. Thrombocytopenia, which is one of the side effects of these, well, one of the possible side effects of the Oxford AstraZeneca and the uh, Janssen Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Um, thrombocytopenia has been consistently reported following the administration of adenoviral gene transfer vectors, which of course is what this, va these vaccines are. Um, Adenovirus-induced thrombocytopenia is potentially a serious complication of gene therapy protocols using this type of vector. Now, this is gene therapy protocols. And of course, we're not talking about gene therapy in the case of vaccination, but it's still an adenovirus vector transfer. Um, understanding its mechanism may help the development of measures to prevent this adverse event. This is this is from this this paper. I mean, click on it for yourself. You know, it's all there. It's a fairly specialised paper. It's not really that amenable to understanding, but it's all there. Um, in this report, we have studied platelet adenovirus interaction. So the platelets are the thrombocytes. So um, a thrombocytopenia is a lack of platelets or a lack of thrombocytes. Platelets is just the common word for for thrombocytes. In this report, we have studied platelet adenovirus interactions in, in vitro and in vivo, in, in test tubes and in life, uh, after intravenous administration of adenovirus to mice. Now, notice this is after intravenous administration. That's the key word there, intravenous. We show that adenovirus-induced platelet activation. Now, when you activate the platelets, they stick together and they stick to other things. Platelet activation means they become more sticky, which of course is what you want if you want to heal a wound and stop it from bleeding. But you don't want it to happen in the blood vessels. So platelet, so we show that adenovirus induced platelet activation. In other words, adenovirus is making platelets more sticky and likely to clump together, causing thrombus and clots, and promotes the formation of platelet leukocyte aggregates both in vitro, in glass, and in life. Now, that's the American spelling of white blood cell leukocyte. So what they're saying is you get clumps of platelets and white blood cells. And uh, then red blood cells will stick to that after that. So um, this, is, this is the beginning of, of, of clotting. Anyway, they, they go on. Um, thrombocytopenia occurs between 5 and 24 hours after intravenous, intravenous administration of adenoviruses to mice. Adenovirus vectors to mice. So it's intravenous again. Adenovirus activates platelets and induces rapid exposure of P. Don't, don't worry about that. that. Anyway, it's just saying it activates platelets again. These are the clotting factors that are affected. Adenovirus activates endothelial cells. Now, the endothelial cells are the size cells that line the inside of the blood vessels, which, is, of course, is where the blood clots form. So pretty interesting, really. So, of course, you might say, well, this is not a problem because the vaccines are given intramuscularly, not intravenously. But of course, when you stick the needle into the deltoid muscle, va vaccinators are taught to stick it in and then inject straight away, just like that. They're not told to suck back. I was always trained to stick it in and then suck back to make sure you're not in a vessel. Because if you are in a vessel, it's very obvious you'll see blood coming back. So if you're in a vessel like that, 
you'll see the blood coming back into the syringe and then of course you wouldn't give it but that is not being done by the vast majority of people. Now, I've watched videos of many people doing this, and a few people um, that are obviously experienced injectors do. Uh, the vast majority uh, don't. So this could be the problem. Because when this is given intravenously, um, it looks like these, uh, th this activation occurs. Now, we've talked about incorrect injection technique, vaccine techniques, and rare blood clots. So th this, this, is from, uh, this is from Denmark. So the State Seam Institute of Denmark now recommends injecting uh, injection aspiration before injecting the vaccine, which is not the protocol in the UK, and as far as I know is not the protocol in the United States. So there's suspicion as to whether accidental injection of the vaccine into a blood vessel could play a role in, in the formation of the thrombocytopenia and the blood clots. Uh, intravascular administration may lead to systemic inflammatory reactions, including blood clots. So as a result of this... Um, the, the, uh, the Danish nursing council made recommendations that COVID-19 vaccines should be given with aspiration before injection in this country. And as far as I know, the United States, the protocols don't want us to do that. Uh, D Danish authorities' aspiration is recommended for all approved COVID-19 vaccines, consistent with the Danish Health and Medicines Authority's guidelines. Um, uh, va vaccination personnel should ensure they are injected correctly into a muscle, not into the bloodstream, and it goes on. So um, what we do is we put together the theoretical evidence from, from this, from mice, from this paper from mice, saying thrombocytopenia has been consistently reported following administration of adenovirus gene transfer vectors. This is known about. So we have, we have a theoretical complicate. well, it's more than theoretical, it's, it's a known thing. So now the, 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 these side effects are rare and through my, for in, in my career of giving injections for 40 years, I think, I think I might remember putting this into a muscle once and drawing back some blood, but that was the only time. So the other thousands of times you don't. So suppose an inadvertent intravascular injection is given once every 10,000 times and that happens to coincide with, say, a pre-menopausal a, a pre woman who is on oral contraceptives. You know, it's just a variable to eliminate. And I think it's a very real thing. Why don't we just teach our vaccinators to inject and aspirate and then we would get rid of this variable? Anyway, so to that end, um, I really don't know what to do. So I've written to my MP about it. And uh, my MP is very good at this kind of thing. He will pass it on to the requisite authorities in the departments of health. So if you're in the States, I think you should ask your elected representatives, should we be doing this? Should we be aspirating to prevent possible intravenous administration because if this is a genuine cause and effect if, if giving if, if giving adenovirus vector vaccines is actually causing the thrombocytopenia and the, the cerebral sinus vein thrombosis if that turns out to be the case and there's indications that it could be or be but it's rare then the implications of teaching vaccinators around the world to stick the needle in draw back make sure you're not in a blood vessel then inject it, it is massive it will massively increase the credibility of the campaigns and, 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 and how hard is it? You stick it in and you draw it back. And, you know, I've been doing it for 40 years. So um, I think um, it's worth writing to your elected representative about that and asking that question. And if, if, if Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance go on TV and say, look, we've decided there is no need to aspirate during intramuscular injections for vaccines, then so be it. But th 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 this should be an evidence-based formal, formal consideration. And uh, at the moment, we're just doing the COVID vaccines the same as all the other vaccines. But these are new vaccines. We've never had M mRNA vaccines before. We've, we've never, we've, apart from some Ebola um, that hasn't been given to that many people, we, have, we haven't had the adenovirus vector vaccines before. This is new stuff, and yet we're doing it with the old protocols. So I think that's a pretty important point. Um, anyway, I, I put in I put in lots of uh, lo lots of references for that. I mean, I could go on. I'm, I'm, we have we have looked at this before. Danish Nursing Council. These are all on Google Translate. Now I'm going to put these all in the uh, in the ref in the description for this video. If you do decide to write to your elected representative to ask this question, um, you, you're only allowed to put so many characters in the in the description. So I'll probably have to leave some of the stuff out. But it'll all be there if you want to do that. And I really just think it's a variable to eliminate. 
um, be, be, because because we know that th- there's this known science that intravenous administration of adenovirus vectors causes thrombocytopenia and platelet activation, which could prevent prevent potentially cause coag- um, intravascular coagulation. So w- w- why why not do that? Okay, um, so that's that. Um, yeah, WHO guidelines. They say the vaccine should uh, be given intravenously, but then they say it's not necessary to aspirate the syringe after the needle is introduced. To me, this is just a contradiction. I don't know where the World Health Organization is coming from. The only way I know to be certain that you're giving it, uh, you're not giving it into a vessel, is to aspirate to make sure you're not in a vessel. And yet they say you don't need to aspirate. And it's such a simple thing. Why don't we just do it? Tell all our vaccinators to do it that way. We could train them, I could train them up in minutes to do this. Right, on to better news. Herd immunity. It's starting to look promising. Let's start off with data from uh, Israel. In fact, we'll just look at the uh, the situation here. This is the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, tracker. So 832 million doses given 154 countries, uh, 18.8 million doses a day. Israel is still ahead with, uh, it's not been updated since last time I checked, uh, 56.9% of the population coverages. UK is not too far behind, actually. Um, well, no, it's a bit behind. Yeah, OK. <laughs> but we're, we're coming on. Right, um, more on that in a minute. Actually, that, that's, that's out. That's well out. What's that talking about? That's well out of date. 40 million doses is enough. Yeah, we'll come on to more accurate information in a minute. Right, um, so herd immunity in Israel, a population is 5.3 million. 56.9% have been vaccinated at least, and of course it's going up all the time. And 830,000 people have already tested positive. Put those together and you get at least 68% of the population who've either been exposed to the virus or exposed to the vaccine, therefore have some potential immunity. And we look, well, I'm not going to show them again today, but we looked yesterday how the, the numbers are going down in Israel. The new cases are going down and the deaths are going down in Israel. It really seems to be working. Uh, this professor from a medical center in Israel, herd immunity is the only explanation of the decreasing numbers in Israel. Um, they say uh, cases uh, continue and more restrictions are lifted. So cases are going down, restrictions are being lifted. The explanation for this is herd immunity. So that is looking promising. The professor goes on to say, there is a continuous decline despite returning to near normalcy of behaviour. This tells us that even if a person is infected, most people they meet walking around won't be infected by them. This is herd immunity in essence, isn't it? Cases are falling in all age groups, including children who are not being vaccinated. So it looks like children are enjoying the herd immunity effect of their elders not infecting them. And Google data shows that the Israelis are well and truly out and about. They're on the move all over the place from Google data. And um, they've also got a green pass now in Israel. So if you want one, click on there and I think you can apply for one if you want to go to Israel for your holidays. Other holiday venues are available, but it just this is just show. I'm, I put that there because it's the way ahead. Um, green passes are the way ahead for travel. Now, coming on to the UK, first dose in the UK is actually 62%. So that Bloomberg map was out of date. So 62% for the first dose, second dose 16%, 5 to 10% natural immunity. So can you can see we're getting up there. We're getting up there near the Israeli uh, near the Israeli figure now in the UK. 62% with some level of protection, 16% with a higher level of protection, 5 to 10% with natural immunity. So we well, we would believe natural immunity. So we're, we're getting up there now. So uh, Tim Spector, always worth listening to his weekly uh, update, of course. Hope you're all still filling out the COVID symptom tracker app. It's not called that now. It's called the COVID symptom study. That's it. COVID symptom study, it's called now. Um, so now Boris Johnson was saying yesterday that the reduction in cases in the UK is mostly down to lockdown. Well, it's partly due to that. 
But Tim Spector disagrees with Boris Johnson and he says it's largely due to vaccination. So there you go. Prime Minister said it's mostly due to lockdown. Tim Spector says it's primarily due to success in vaccination. Herd immunity started to have an effect, he believes. You know, this is remarkably encouraging. The vaccinations are going up daily. Now, reinfection risk with no vaccines. The risk of getting reinfected if you're not vaccinated, 1 in 1,100. If you've had your first vaccine, 1 in, one, one in 5,100. If you've had two shots, 1 in 15,000. Massive benefits of vaccination. And everyone who'd had two shots or had very mild uh, infections after their second shot. So even if people were reinfected, they could potentially pass it on theoretically. But for them, it was brilliant because they weren't sick just a little bit. All very mild infections after the second shot, but only one in 15,000 people who've had two doses of vaccine getting reinfected. So good news. Now, the clots, uh, the COVID symptom uh, study is also looking at clots. And they find that blood clots, the, Tim didn't specify in this talk, but the, the, the blood clots in the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca group are the same. Uh, the, the AstraZeneca group is not showing an excess of blood clots, but there's only half a million people in each group. Only a million people are reporting who've been vaccinated. So, um, and th those because these side effects are rare, that's not enough to pick it up. So he did qualify it with that. But from the million samples he has, uh, that they, they are the same. Now, how are we going for the United States? So just a quick reminder, the UK first dose 62%. Second dose, 16%. United States, just checked, 37.3% and 23.1%. Uh, so from the UK data, we can assume that these people have, who've had the first dose have a, uh, here, here it is, uh, one chance in uh, 5,100, as the Americans would say. Uh, <laughs> we say 5,100 in the UK. One chance in 5,100 of getting infections after one shot. Uh, but after two shots, uh, one chance in 1,500. Is it 15,000 anyway, not 1,500? Sorry, I'm, I'm getting confused now, translating between American and English numbers. 15,000 anyway. After two shots, one in 15,000 gets uh, reinfected in the UK. So presumably that's the same in the United States. So I think what we're actually seeing is we're getting a better overall herd immunity effect from the UK strategy, giving the one vaccine uh, with a longer interval be before that and the second vaccine. We're getting more herd immunity effect more quickly, as well as eking out our vaccine supply. So um, what do we take? What are, what are the implications of this? We must carry on with all of the social distancing we have been doing as per the government regulations. We have to carry on with that. As we carry on with the vaccination program, more and more herd immunity will kick in and transmission levels will go down and down. This is just brilliant news. This is the evidence that we've been waiting for, that the vaccination program is inducing herd immunity. And I think we've got like that from Israel now and we're just starting to get that from the UK as well. Of course, we need this for the whole world. But uh, remarkably encouraging. A uh, bit, bit disappointing, this site's a bit out of date then. So, um, um, but uh, you can have a look at it. It's all, the, the links are there. Um, Europe still not doing so well. America, better. Canada, not doing too well for vaccine supply issues. And good to see that our Australian brothers and sisters have made a start. Good. Right. So um, last thing I want to do today is we looked at the report from the uh, Air Octas, the Irish Parliament um, report on vitamin D and public health. So this is the second part of that. Um, I'll put a link on for the first part if you want to go back and watch it. Very interesting official report to the Irish Parliament. And this is going to be implemented as far as we know in Ireland. Uh, now, the second part's on international experience, international uh, learning about vitamin D levels. Um, opportunities to learn from the mistakes and successes of those uh, in the international approaches makes perfect sense. 
there's a need to address this issue, COVID and non-COVID. So what the Irish are saying that there's COVID implications of low levels of vitamin D, but there's also lots of non-COVID implications of low levels of vitamin D as we looked at before. Uh, not only is it associated with poor immunity for COVID, but poor immunity for other things and other conditions, various cancers and uh, other conditions, heart disease, uh, multiple sclerosis, associations. Right, uh, Finland's got the lowest COVID mortality in Europe. Now, this is, um, have I got a picture of that? Yeah, I think I have. So there, there we go. This is actually Finland down there. So Finland have got the lowest amount of uh, deaths per million of the population in the European geographical area. So that's Finland down there. And then the Irish report goes on to suggest that this is related to the vitamin D supplementation uh, and the need for Ireland to take urgent action on this matter. Now, what the report points out is 2003 national recommendation for fortification of uh, liquid milks and uh, spreadable fats in Finland. Uh, 2010, uh, doubled levels of this fortification. So they increased in 2010. 2014, increased recommended, recommended doses to achieve meaningful benefit of immunological function. So what, what in 2014, they said they had to increase the recommended dose to achieve a meaningful benefit on immunological function. So the clear there that this is saying it does have an effect on immunity. And they're saying 20 micrograms a day, that's 800 units, double what the UK is recommending uh, for all aged age 75 and over was that initial recommendation. 2016, they reported in Finland again, 75% of adults had achieved blood vitamin D levels above the critical 50 nanomoles a litre. This is interesting. Or uh, um, no, that, sh that should actually be 20 nanograms, 20 nanograms per mil because it's 2.5, isn't it? So they're saying that for immune function, you need at least 50 nanomoles a litre, which is the same as 20 nanograms a mil. Threshold for enhanced immunity. So that's the threshold. In other words, they're saying below those levels, immunity can be compromised from the, from the finished study. It is highly plausible that enhanced population vitamin D status has been a significant factor in Finland's low observed incidence and case fatality rates for COVID-19 over recent months, according to the Irish report. Pretty clear. Spain, they talked about the Cordova study and the Calcifidiol, which we've looked at before. Uh, uh, now, I didn't know this. France, May 2020 in France. Uh, French National Academy of Medicine, anyone under the age of 60 who was diagnosed with SARS coronavirus 2 infection, according to these uh, National Academy of Medicine guidelines, should be immediately supplemented with 20 to 25 um, micrograms. That's uh, but basically a thousand international units of vitamin D daily. Those over 60 years should have their vitamin D levels tested immediately after SARS COVID diagnosis. So they should have their blood levels tested to see what their vitamin D blood levels are. And uh, should supplementation with a loading dose. So if their levels are low, they should be supplemented with a loading dose of 50 to 100,000 units, uh, which is a large dose of vitamin D where deficiency was confirmed. So that's the French guidelines as reported by the Irish authorities. So that is, um, that is interesting. So um, just show that again, Finland there, remarkably low levels. Um, now, yesterday, um, so that, 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 that's basically the end of the talk for today. Yesterday I was going, to, I had this thing, who are these guys? Now, um, then my voice ran out, so I couldn't, I couldn't, quite, uh, couldn't quite finish it off. But what it is, that there's, there's a team of academics and they're doing the most amazing meta-analysis. Now, we don't know who these academics are. That's why I said, who are these guys? They're, they're almost like, um, the, you know, Superman or Batman or something of the science community. They're doing this science and they're publishing it anonymously. Now, because it's published anonymously, we can't take anything of it. But I, I've read some of it and it seems to be very, very good science. So I've, I've put that link there for you to have a look at. 
Um, I'll make sure that gets into the uh, description. Just, just very interesting to uh, to have a browse of that. So um, th this is this is the meta analysis they do of vitamin uh, vitamin D. Um, so um, all treatments studied fifty five percent improvement. Uh, all mortality results sixty two percent improvement. All sufficiency studies fifty four percent improvement. So, so treatment studies are where you actually give vitamin D, then monitor the results. Sufficiency is where you correlate the levels of vitamin D with the effects. Now, as I say, we can't say anything about this because it's not published. But, but here we have all 23 vitamin D COVID treatment studies, for example. And um, early treatment is associated with 90% improvement. Um, later treatment, 52% improvement and... Uh, uh, that, 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 that's pre-exposure, uh, PR, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So preventative treatment, they, they say 40% improvement. So th these are the forest plots that we looked at uh, a few videos ago as well. So um, th that would be the line there of no difference. That would mean that vitamin D makes it worse. Anything on that side means it makes it better. This study here was, was giving vitamin D at a very late stage to people that were already poorly. So... Um, this is just packed full of really, that's that study there where it was given at a late stage because we know it takes about a week to activate the vitamin D in the liver unless you give the calcifidiol like the Spanish study did. So they've got all sorts of stuff there and, it, you know, masses and masses of really quite impressive stuff. And it's really surprising because um, academics live or die by their publication, publish or perish in academia. You get paid by doing your publication. So, so if you've done three good publications in your university professional, an academic, then uh, in the UK, that I don't know what it is now, but when I was in the universities, it was something called the research assessment exercise, and you put your papers in, and the university got a stack of money for the papers that you as an academic had published. And yet these guys are putting all this mass amount of work in, but we don't know who they are. So this indicates to me that they feel very strongly about this uh, data, that it needs to get out there. Um, and of course, they give all the references and everything. Um, the, and, but um, the, they're, not, uh, they're not saying who they are. So why wouldn't they say who they were? It's, it's almost as if they thought that publishing this sort of material would have some deleterious effect on their academic careers or leave them open to some other form of recrimination. It's almost, it's almost like that, isn't it? But, but of course, we, we don't know because we don't know who they are. OK, so um, there you go. That's uh, academic information for your perusal and interest. But uh, I must say, you know, this has been done by teams of academics. It's not, it's not one individual who's done this. And um, it's clearly coordinated, clearly fascinating. And who are these guys? Okay, that is us for today. Thank you for watching.